People say that running an airline is not an easy thing to do. You have weather to deal with, energy prices to deal with, lots of employees and so forth. But you grew up in a family of nine children. So what is easier, growing up a family of nine children or running an airline? Uh, running an airline, certainly. Uh, uh, this, our, our, uh, our, our family was great. I, I'm the oldest of nine. And I was sharing with David earlier that when I was five years old, my mom, we already had six kids in the house. And so nine kids sharing three bedrooms, one and a half baths. My dad was a dentist. He had his practice inside our house. And my mom worked for him. And so it was a... Wasn't but, that busy a practice at times, I guess? <laughs> he must have had some gaps in his right, schedule okay. there. Yeah. But, the, but the interesting thing about it was that growing up, I didn't, I didn't travel by... I didn't, I didn't board an airplane until I was 25 years old. Really? Uh, we couldn't afford it. You know, we too many of us, and it just wasn't who we were. And I always recall one of my, my most stark visuals of my childhood is we went on one, one family trip a year. My dad would get us all in the station wagon. And so it's wow. apologies to our safety friends and regulators in the audience. But the, there were no seatbelts. There were no car seats. There were nine of us, my mom, my dad, my grandmother, in a station wagon, uh, all piled in. With, with, uh, right. we, we were allowed to uh, put whatever we could fit in our pillowcase and brought it for two weeks. And that was, that was our family trip. So I, I must have figured somewhere in my unconsciousness, there has to be a better way to travel. And so, I, uh, so I'm still on that pursuit and that mission to this day. Now, your mother must be proud that her son, our first child, oldest child, is the CEO of Delta Airlines, which is the largest US air carrier. Does largest she, carrier in the world. Does she ever call you with ideas or complaints or not that much? Uh, all the time. All the time. She, uh, she gives me her ideas. I, I always ask her, please, when she's traveling, not to tell anybody who she is. Okay. And that, that never lasts. Uh, I, I, I've caught her, uh, people have told me that she, she applauds at the end of the little safety announcement that I do on the front end of the plane. So it's kind of, it's kind of cute. Now, you travel on Delta yourself yes, most I of do. the time. Yes, I do. Most of the time. So you fly coach, is that right? I often fly coach, yeah. I, I find it more interesting back there. Okay. Is it, what about the leg room back there, though? Well, the leg room is, the leg room is fine. You know, we got, uh, we got... <laughs> what, what you find when you, you fly in coach is it's more entertaining, so you don't worry about your leg room. You see what else is going on. That's, that's where the real people are, and that's, right. Where, the, right, so and when people, that's where the party is. But do people know who you are? You're sitting back there with all Absolutely. these people, and do they know who you are? And do they say, well, let me give you a good idea or something? Well, they, they usually ask me why, uh, why I couldn't get a seat up front, and I, I tell them for what I pay for a ticket, that's about the best I can afford okay. to, uh, to, to get. And I don't even get freaking flyer miles. Why not? Well, I didn't pay for the ticket. Okay. So um, let's talk about uh, running an airline generally. Um, to be honest, there are a lot of people that say if you want to run an airline or run a big business, go to a good business school or work your way up and be a management expert and so forth. But you were trained as an accountant, which is a great profession, but some people would say the best managers in the world are not CPAs, right? That's probably a fair statement. All right, so how did you become uh, such a good manager? Delta is widely considered to be an excellently run airline. Where did you get the training to, to be such a good manager? Well, one of the things about accountants that I think they get a bad rap is that they're all about the numbers and very introverted and you know, into their analysis is that what, what you learn as an accountant is, is the numbers are actually the language and the vocabulary of business. And when you work in a number of different settings, a number of different clients and industries, which as an accountant, I started my career with Price Waterhouse, I got to see a great snapshot of, okay. a great snapshot of, of how companies succeeded and understood more the financial, okay. became more inquisitive as to why that was, and you, you ask good questions. You also find, find yourself in, in rooms with people that actually are intimidated by the numbers and don't understand. So you actually, right. ha at an early age, you have a chance to kind of elevate your, your, your own credentials and, and explore. And, and you know, analytical skills are, are certainly something that's critical to what I still do today. All right, so you would hire a lot of accountants under you or not? We, we have a fair number of accountants. We've got, a, we got enough accountants for now. But, what about uh, lawyers or private equity we, people? We, we, have, we, have, we have lawyers, we have private equity, we have, uh, we have okay. almost 90,000 people. So. so for some reason, Wall Street does not value airline companies as much as you would say they should. You have yeah. a PE multiple of eight or nine, and yep. if you're lucky. Um, why is it that Wall Street doesn't value airlines as much as you think they should? Well, we're, we're moving in that direction. We're still not there. Um, our largest investor is uh, Warren Buffett. Now, he now owns 11% of Delta. 
And Warren, after years of having sworn off the industry, had a, uh, had a saying which I loved. He said, you, you guys are the Chicago Cubs of the, of the business world. You not only had a bad decade, you had a bad century. And uh, okay. so we got our bad century out of the way. And we're now in a place where we've, we've really fixed the business. Nice. We've, we've invested in quality. We've invested in uh, the performance, the reliability on Delta leads the industry by, by good measure. And it's been years and hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of investment in creating the platform that we can now offset a lot of the volatility and the reasons why people are sitting well, away. He, he changed his mind because he used to say, if a capitalist had been a Kitty Hawk seeing the Wright brothers take off, he would have shot them down because <laughs> uh, there was no profits made in the airline industry for 100 years when you compare the profits versus yeah. the losses. But that's changed a bit now. It's, it's changed and he wouldn't say that uh, today, I bet, if you, if you were to ask him. We, uh, this year will be the fifth year in a row our profits have been in, in excess of $5 billion. Uh, double digit margins were growing about 7% a year, top line. Uh, in the top quartile amongst the Fortune 100 of fastest growth companies. So how many, right now you have about 89,000 employees? That's correct. So how many are female, how many are male? Actually, we have more female than male in the population. And what about pilots? What percentage are female? How many pilots do you have? We have 15,000 pilots. The majority, the vast majority are male. And what about flight attendants? How many do you have? We have about 25,000 flight attendants, probably 75, 25 female to male. Okay. And your revenues are what percentage in the United States and what percentage outside? Our revenue is about two-thirds U.S., one-third international. And international, is that more profitable than U.S. generally because of longer no, flights? No, it's actually just the opposite. International is a lot more difficult to get to. It's a lot more, the planes are bigger, the fuel costs more, the, uh, the service levels obviously are substantially higher. And ticket prices, because there's a lot of competition internationally, are, are, are more suppressed. We actually make about 80% of our profits in the U.S., closer to home. And you make a lot of profits, some people say, by owning your own refinery. Why do you need your own refinery? You don't trust other people to get gasoline to you? Well, we, we do, and we, we certainly use a lot of refineries. But about six, seven years ago, as refineries up and down the East Coast were being closed when oil prices, crude prices were well north of $100, we saw that our cost of jet fuel was, was escalating at rapidly. We're, in fact, paying another $25 a barrel on top of the crude price just to get jet fuel because we are the most price insensitive uh, consumers of that product. We don't decide each day whether we f fuel our planes up or not. We tell them six months out we're coming. So any of the costs that the refiners have are kind of being pushed onto the airlines. And so we needed to break that curve and get more supply into the market. We, we've got a great refinery and it's outside of Philadelphia, a trainer that we acquired. Uh, we opened it, it was closed for, for, uh, okay. for about a year. We put, we put a whole community back to work and it was a great story, and to this day, uh, it's, it's been very profitable. We've, we've earned our returns on that many fold. Okay. Now, in 1970s, there was a big push for airline deregulation. Prices had been set by the international, the ICC. That's right. Um, Interstate Commerce Commission used to set the prices. Mm -hmm. It was deregulated, and that stopped uh, the regulation of pricing, among other things. Uh, we then had probably 10 or 12 major domestic airlines. Now we have more or less three or four. Mm -hmm. So has a deregulation really worked for the American people or has it not worked? Oh, it's, it's absolutely worked. Uh, when you think about, there was a lot of ravages of, of deregulation. A lot of airlines went out of business because right. they no longer could compete with the upstarts. Uh, it drove consolidation in our industry. We needed scale. Even as recently as 20 years ago, we still had 10, 10 big airlines right. flying around the U.S. Now, you know, argu arguably we have somewhere between five and six and I think it's a, it's a much stronger base that we can invest in the reliability of what we're providing. One of the changes, David, that's happened in the industry that caused problems for years was that we were seeing nothing, uh, just a commodity. You know, price was the, right. almost the sole determinant of what airline you took. We've changed that paradigm where we're now competing on quality and service and people. And price is still important, but that's not the main reason people well, fly Delta. Well, suppose somebody does care about price more than anything else. What's the best way to get the lowest price on a ticket? Is well, it, base, basic economy on Delta. Well, is it to uh, buy the ticket well in advance? Is it to go through uh, your, your own website yeah, or we, go through a travel agent we, website? We have, we have low fares every day of the week. Uh, it's really, the pricing in the industry has gotten a lot more segmented. And we have a, what we call a basic economy feature where you agree that you know, price is all you want, the lowest price, right. so you may not have an assigned seat. You may not, you know, may, may be one of the last people to board the plane. 
but you don't care because you just want to get there with okay. Delta Quality well, Service. I suppose I really care price. where I'm sitting, and I really want some good food, and if I, I pay a little more? Or you'll, pay, you'll pay a little more, but the other thing that's changed about the airline industry is even a decade ago, the, the, the retail price on first class versus coach would be a factor of eight to ten times. We've brought the retail price of coach down to where today right. it's only about two to three times our average fare in the main cabin, so it's a heck of a lot more affordable. And as a result, we sell about 75% of our first okay. class seats. In the past, we would give 90% away. Well, in the old days, the 70s or 80s, if you flew on a commercial plane, it might be half filled, and you could spread out, you could put your materials there, you had a lot of room, people wouldn't bother you. Now every seat is filled. Why is that? Well, because, because fares are affordable, people are traveling. But it's not your algorithms are such that you really know better how to fill the seats? No, not, not at all. It's, it's, it's really been a function of pricing. Uh, pricing over time, deregulation has worked. It's democratized the skies. And airfares today are about 40% cheaper in real dollars than just 25 okay. years ago. What about frequent, frequent flyer programs? They add cost to the ticket because you have to give these um, frequent flyer miles. What about if everybody got rid of those? Would that hurt or help your industry? Well, lo loyalty is real, is real important in our business, as it is in many businesses. And the loyalty program we have with not just travel, but also we have a, a great commercial partner in American Express and who, who buys miles as well from us and, and provides another diversified revenue stream for the company. Now, you have an unusual relationship with American Express, and that is like 5% of your profits or something like that? Or what is it's it? It's almost 10% of our revenues come from the American Express relationship. And how does that work? What, why why don't, doesn't anybody else have that? Well, each, each airline has their own, their own bank. And, right. you know, some, some work with J.P. Morgan Chase, some work with, with Citi, and some work with Barclays and others. But the American Express Delta relationship is an right. exclusive relationship in the U.S. And we put all our resources towards each other. We, we, we're very focused on growing the American Express brand. We're the most important provider of cards for American Express. In their, in, their, right. in their Revolve portfolio, almost 25% of their revolving portfolio for American Express as a whole is the Delta but card. The best, and it's also the fastest growing product they have in their But the best their way system. to get a cheap price, is it to go on a website that you have, <laughs> or is it a website of a travel agent? What percent of your tickets are the sold? Best, the, best, the best fare you can get on Delta, and you should try it sometime. I'll, I'll, let, me know when you, let me know when you do. Right. Uh, as a cheap shot, I'm sorry. Uh, is, All right, try it. Is go, is go on delta.com. Right. We sell almost 50% of our tickets on delta.com, our right. own distribution, not, not an online agency. And we have a, a low fare guarantee that you cannot find a lower price for the ticket. If you happen to find it, we'll reimburse that, that fund. Okay. And go and, buy, and purchase what's called a basic economy fare. So it's, it's about anywhere okay. between 10 to 20% cheaper than the lowest okay. economy fare on the, on, the, on the price. Now, when you buy that fare on, on the screen, we're going to flash it. Are you sure this is what you want to buy? Because you're going to be the last one on the plane. You're not going to probably have any room overhead for your, for right. your bags. But you're going to get a great, a great product service offer. Well, from right, suppose I say I want a cheap price, but I want some good food. I mean, do, is food a big deal to people that fly these days? Food, food is important, and we've, we've brought a lot of food back. Uh, you know, the industry 15 years ago wound up getting rid of food, getting rid of you know, basically anything, and wound up charging fees, uh, fees galore. You know, we've come full circle on that. We, we've reintroduced main cabin uh, food services on a significant number of our, of our yeah. aircraft, and, and international really improving the overall quality of the experience. Suppose I say, I want a cheap fare. I don't care about food. I'll bring my own food on. Can you bring your own food on? You can bring your own food on. Oh, you bring your own food on, and, but I just want to make sure my luggage isn't lost. So what percentage of people um, actually lose their luggage? Or we, never, we never lose. We call them mishandled. Mishandled. Because <laughs> we, uh, okay. we, uh, what percentage we, all, we always know where it is. It just takes us a little longer to get to sometimes. But no, okay. seriously. Has that ever we, happened to you? Uh, it has, yes. Uh, really? What, don't you, you call up somebody and say, I'm the CEO, I mean, you lost my luggage? I absolutely, or mishandled I it? absolutely do. Uh, that's, I, I say, are you kidding me? Uh, no, like, like customers do. No, but, but what happens is we, we've invested in, in technologies to accelerate the, both the baggage delivery as well as the tracking. Uh, in Delta today, we've got RFID in every one of our bag tags. So we know okay. there's that chip in every bag tag. We know where it is on the, the Fly Delta app okay. that, that you're traveling with. You can actually track your bag. You know, we have some customers that sit there 
on the plane and look at the app to make sure their bag is traveling with them. It's a sense of security. You know, it's kind of a warm feeling. People tell me that they That's see their bag got loaded. They can watch it. Are those watch the people buying loaded. the expensive tickets or the least expensive ones? They have they time can, to they do got, that. Okay. They are, they are the low, they can, all levels, okay. all right. levels of tickets. Now, uh, and, and then, it, but, but the, the answer to your question is less than one in a thousand right. will actually wind up getting mishandled. Now, what about uh, if I want to not have paper? I want to buy a, I don't need to uh, have a ticket. What about facial recognition? Can you just board an airline with facial recognition techniques? Yes, we can. We've got the, in, inter in uh, Atlanta, the international facility is entirely biometric. So you get out of the car, you, you, you go to the security uh, queue through the facial recognition profile if you wanted to. It's an opt-in. We're not going to force people to go down this path. You, you'll be recognized right. facially. You'll be able to get right through, get on the, on the plane, board that same way. You don't have to show right. your passport. You don't have to show your ticket. You have to buy your ticket, but you don't have to show it. And, and, and get on the plane. And when you return to the States, you can go through that same process back. So if somebody wants to buy a ticket and they show up and they just do it with cash, is that a problem? We don't, we don't take cash You don't anymore. take any cash we anymore? We don't take cash anymore. Okay. Cash creates problems. All right. So, um, there is a... Uh, phenomenon where you can bring an animal on board that is a uh, emotional support animal. And um, recently, not on your airline, but another airline I won't mention, a pony went on as an emotional support uh, animal. Um, do you allow ponies on your airline? We, uh, we, try not to, uh, we try not to let ponies get onto the, uh, get, get onto the airplane. No, we, we, uh, it's, it's a serious topic. You know, we, uh, we've had a, a, a wrath of emotional support animals of all variety. Uh, I was reading the other day in New Zealand, of all places, uh, someone brought an emotional support clown with them uh, to, to, to get on because they were going to a job interview where they thought they weren't going to get, and that was the rationale why they needed to have this clown on the plane. So I, I don't know what ever happened to that, but I found, found it curious. Uh, but the, uh, you know, we, we've, we've, got, we've tightened up the restrictions. Okay. Uh, we want to make certain all valid service animals are, are provided, provided okay. access to Delta, but at the same time, people have seen it as a way of, of okay. avoiding uh, the cost of transporting right. their now, animals. Now, um, there has been a problem with um, pe uh, people who are flying on planes drinking too much alcohol, and sometimes they get abusive and they have to be taken off. What is the rule on how much alcohol somebody can be given by one of your flight attendants? Well, we don't have a rule. We, we trust our people to use their, their good judgment. And obviously, when you're flying, uh, the impact of alcohol is a heightened level than it is on the ground. Okay. And I think some people, as they travel, may not be aware of that. Uh, but our, our, our flight attendants are very good about spotting and identifying okay. issues with respect to uh, intoxication. Now, not your airline, but some other airlines have had problems with pilots who are drinking alcohol. How do you? prevent that from happening. I mean, you don't have a, a breathalyzer for pilots, right? So we don't. You know, we, we trust our pilots to take, take proper professional care, and our pilots do. Our pilots are the best in the business. Uh, we do have a rule that eight hours, uh, no, no alcohol can be consumed you know, prior, to, prior to flight from our pilots, and, and our pilots do a great right. job. So you us. have 15,000 pilots, more or less? Yeah. And uh, pilots, um, they're generally compensated at what range, from what range to what range? Well, we got the pilots' union in the room. They can probably tell you. Oh, they say they probably say it's not enough. Uh, okay. But it's, uh, well, how much? How much is a pilot allowed to fly uh, a month? Is there is that is there a limit to the number of hours, or is it? There there are there are thresholds. Our, our average pilots uh, fly you know during the month somewhere anywhere between 60 to 80 hours uh, a month on average. Uh, of course, then they have considerable amounts of time that they have for training and. And, okay. and go through their, their certification. It also has to get factored into the, uh, the, the calculus. Now, when you're an airline executive, you basically have two um, companies you can buy planes from, more or less. Is that right? Two. Two. It's, it's not more or less. More or less. <laughs> well, unless you're, yeah, more or less. I was trying to be polite, but more or less. So you have Boeing and you have Airbus. Yeah. Now, you fly a lot of Boeings, yeah. and in fact, your longest uh, flight is from Atlanta to Johannesburg, 17 hours. That's right. And that's a, Bo a, Do a Boeing 777? Boeing 777, that's right. So, by the way, I mean, how many movies can you watch on a 17-hour flight? A I lot. Mean, that's fun. Really? And there more, are a lot more. of people that go on that flight, and that's a long... How many pilots do you have to take? You know, it's, 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 a, it's a crew of four pilots, and uh, you know, we're the relief okay. crowds. It's a, and that's why I say international is an right. expensive product to serve. But you chose not to buy the 737 MAX for reasons unrelated to what later came to be a problem. And is that an advantage to you now because you have the Airbus 321 and that's uh, giving you more capacity than some of your competitors? 
and do you take credit for that decision, or was that luck, or what I, happened? I, I put that solely in the you'd rather be lucky than smart category. No, we, 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 listen, we, we're, we're big fans of Boeing, and we're, we're hoping to see the MAX flying quickly in, into the skies, okay. but we never, that was, safety was never part of the consideration set in making that decision. How many airplanes do you lease or, or own? I guess you lease them all, but. No, no, we own uh, almost, we, about 80% we own, okay. uh, 1,200. 1,200, and how many airports do you fly to? We fly to over 300 and around the world. And more of those in the United States and outside? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So let's go through your background for a moment. Now, we mentioned earlier that you um, grew up in a family of uh, nine. nine children. You were the oldest. I was. Uh, any of your siblings in the airline industry? Thank God, no. They did don't they, need to be. They have me. Do they ever call with complaints? or? They know not to. OK. <laughs> All right. So you went to, uh, you grew up in Poughkeepsie? Poughkeepsie, New York. And uh, you went to college at? St. Bonaventure University. OK, and you got your accounting degree. Yeah. All right, so you're minding your business. You're an accountant at Price Waterhouse. Um, how did you get out of that business and get, initially, you went to Frito-Lay, is that right? That's correct. So what were you I, doing uh, at Frito-Lay? I, I, was, uh, I was fortunate at Price Waterhouse. I, I moved pretty quickly through the ranks there and made partner, and probably made partner at too early an age. I think I was 32 or 33 years old. And, you know, at that point in that profession, that was kind of the pinnacle of, of success. And I said, well, if I'm in a company where the pinnacle of success is 32, I need to go someplace to learn more. I need to, to continue to develop. Uh, the partners at that time thought I was crazy to leave, uh, but I, uh, I decided I, I wanted to, to try something different. And I really wanted to get out of the advising and auditing and consulting into the doing and taking right. responsibility so and test my own, my, own, my own instincts. Did you consider private equity ever? I, no. I did not. I did not. No. So it's, how did you cut the Frito-Lay? Well, I, uh, I got a call from a friend that said Pepsi was, uh, was hiring and uh, introduced me to a, uh, a person at Frito-Lay down, okay. down in Texas. I moved down to Dallas. And, Free to lay, and, and, and I, I don't have a, a graduate degree. I just went to a, an undergrad at, at St. Bonaventure. I've always considered to this day my training at PepsiCo, my seven years spent there, as my, as my postgraduate okay. work, because it's a fascinating company. Now, for free to lay, the chips, are they healthy for you? <laughs> uh, they're, they're getting better. They're getting better. Getting better. Getting, so, but, yeah. I, but I live in Atlanta now, so I'm, a, I'm an avowed Coke person, so I got to okay. be careful. Exactly. I got to be careful with what I say here. Was, was Coke healthy for you? Uh, in, in moderation. Okay. So, all right, so you're at, you're at Free Delay, and then a headhunter or somebody called you and said, How about Delta Airlines? Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I was a, an active business traveler. I was traveling probably 80% of my time, a lot internationally. So I already thought I knew how the airlines worked, and I knew all the things that needed to be fixed about the airlines to actually make it better. So, of course, I get there, and you know, you actually take a peek behind the curtain, see how complex it is. You say, "Well, I never understood uh, what actually went into it." But it was it was an in industry that was fascinating to me because I was a big consumer of it. So you you became a senior vice president for finance eventually, and yeah. then you became, uh, I guess, a chief financial officer. Yes, chief financial officer. And then you became the president. Mm -hmm. And then you became the CEO in May of 2016. That's great. Right? Yep. So since that time, the stock is up uh, roughly 30 some percent, 33 percent, mm -hmm. 9 percent uh, compounded annual growth rate. Yep. So if I bought your stock today, would I get another 9 percent annual growth rate in the stock appreciation? I, I think you're going to do better than that. Better. I think so. I, I really do believe that. Yeah. Okay. But you had some problems before you became the CEO. And ultimately, uh, Delta filed for bankruptcy in 2005. That's right. So why did you have to file, file for bankruptcy? Well, it was uh, the, the aftermath, really, of a, a series of events which 9-11 triggered. You know, we lost our international business almost overnight. Uh, the competition in the U.S. Was, was so competitive with so many airlines trying to take each other's share. It could just kept pushing prices lower and lower and lower. Almost all the airlines wound up filing. You know, Southwest didn't, but most of the airlines did wind up having to go through a formal restructuring process, which was healthy in, uh, in the long run. It was difficult at the time. But it enabled us to, to, to start to focus on what really mattered for our customers and, and the benefits of taking care of our people who are, who are the very best. And you know, this, you know, the last few years, are, we've risen above the, the rest in, in many areas, including our financial success. But it's really been the work for the last 15 years that's enabled us but to get But while you're in point. bankruptcy, US Air said, we want to take you over. Was that considered a friendly offer at the time? Or? Doug Parker will never live that down, no. He, uh, he, he, he made a run at us at US Air. And, uh, we were not going to 
be taken over, let all the hard work that Delta had done, turned it over to it. So we, we, had, a, we had a pretty, pretty hostile uh, takeover battle. I've got an interesting story. You know, we, were, we were bankrupt. We weren't worth anything at the time. And uh, the U.S. Air came in and offered $10 billion uh, to buy Delta. And for, for a company that's not worth anything. And so everyone assumed, well, that's, that's going to be a foregone conclusion. Uh, and the people of the company stood, and they said, it's not going to happen. We have a better idea. We have a better business plan. We were able to convince the creditors through the restructuring process to stay with Delta. And as a result of that, you, you see what we've been able to as do. As part of that, what happened is you said to the employees and your colleagues, we'll give you 10% of the profits to the employees. Is that more or less right? Or well, when we, when we went through the restructuring, a lot, all, our people took a lot of pay cuts. Right. Obviously, benefit losses, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of change. And we made a commitment to the employees then that at that point, once we became profitable, 15% of the 15%. profits would go back right. to the people which we honor to this day, and we still we So still how much that. did that produce, let's say, last year for the employees? Well, last year we paid $1.3 billion to our people okay. in profit share. So now, does that mean your stock price would be higher if you didn't pay it to them, or you're, you have happier employees? I, I, I think our stock price would be lower if we didn't pay it, okay. uh, because cause the engagement that our people have, our people are very, very good at what they do, but they, they also think like owners around the business. and okay. so. So their, their investment in terms of the pr productivity, their service orientation, allows us to rise above. And that's why in a very difficult, complex business, our reliability is off the charts. I just want to throw one stat out there, which I think you all remember. So we, we bought Northwest Airlines in 2000. After you came out of bankruptcy, you bought. After we came out of okay. bankruptcy, we bought Northwest. That, that first year where we put the businesses together, that was a difficult year. That was a difficult year. Our maintenance, just our maintenance cancellations, you know, we've, we, we said, you know, cancellations are the worst thing that can happen to a customer as well as a, a, a Delta employee. We had 6,000 maintenance cancellations that year alone in 2010. 6,000 times canceled just for maintenance only, not, not counting okay. weather and everything else. This past year, that number was 60, 60 a 99% reduction okay. in maintenance because of the quality of the work that our team has okay. done, the investments in predictive engineering and technologies have helped, but it's also a mindset. We, we said okay. coming out of that, that summer of hell that we needed to cancel cancellations, okay. and people thought we were nuts, but we did it. So uh, what is your on-time record now? Are you the highest in the industry? Or we, are, we are the top in the industry. What is that? What's uh, our, the percentage? Our, uh, on average, our on-time rate is somewhere close to 87%. A7, that's when you take off and we, we land, land as the government measures on time within 14 minutes of scheduled arrival. Okay. So 87 percent worldwide. So to make sure you keep that record, do you, do the do the flight attendants say hurry up or we're not going to let you on the plane or what are they? What is, sometimes it's not the fault of the airline, but what is the main? Is it air traffic that uh, controls? Well, air, air traffic congestion certainly is one of one of the reasons why right. why why ten, you know, there there is a delay or certainly weather. Now, is, is a, a contributing factor, but our people are very good at getting people moving through the boarding process, getting settled, helping them, them find their seats and, and, and stow their bags. And, uh, and, and there's, a, there's an operation mindset within the company okay. that, you know, as the biggest hub airline in the world, we've, we've got a higher incentive to run on time than anyone else. Now, the seats are wider than they were 30 years ago because people are bigger. Is that true or not? Well, I, I, I don't know if that's the case, but uh, the, the seats, seats are, are, are certainly, certainly um, you know, fairly comparable. Uh, we haven't changed our, our seat pitch and standard in years, probably over 10 years. Uh, there's more people on the plane. That probably makes them feel a little more, little more crowded. But the, the quality of the service with our people doing, and you know, another thing we've been investing heavily is the in-flight so, in uh, entertainment. Is internet uh, available on all your planes? It's, it's available on almost all our planes. Our smallest regional jets do not have them. But Wi-Fi is and on, you on charge all of our for it or not? We do charge for it, uh, not for a good reason. I, I, I'm a firm believer we need to make Wi-Fi free across all of our, our servers, and we're working towards that. The uh, uh, well, you're the you're the CEO, so you presumably have some influence. Well, in I, I do have influence, and they've they've heard me a hundred times to this, including GoGo, which is our which is our service provider, which I always always tease them. I call them No Go, um, and they they made a lot of progress now. Slow Go, and they'll eventually get to GoGo, uh, but but one of one of the the reasons why. I say it's not a good reason why we charge, you don't pay for internet practically anywhere else, is that they, they, the planes do not have the technical capacity and capability okay. yet 
that if we made it for free, the system would crash. So once it gets above about a 10% take rate on board, performance starts to, starts to erode. And if you, if you turned it on for free, which we've tested many times, it's still not at the level that really? it needs to be. So we're investing heavily in the technical capacity in terms of the satellite okay. uh, spectrum as well as but you mean we can fly to the moon and back and we can't have everybody using internet on the plane at that's, the same time. That, that's exactly you sound you sound like me David you okay. know one of, one of the things I, I tell people is that you know we're, we're, we're closer to the satellites in the sky why shouldn't it move uh, <laughs> be faster but as they remind me we're not traveling 500 miles an hour as we're as okay. we're as we're sitting at home with our Wi-Fi uh, uh, broadband access now how has climate change affected the airline industry do you have to change uh, patterns a little bit been flying because because well, of weather, weather? Well, we certainly have seen this year probably the most volatile weather that we've seen, I, I can recall, uh, this summer. The summer was very, very busy at Delta. We had our best summer ever, uh, over 90% loads throughout the entire summer. Uh, the max being right. down drove even more supply our, our direction. But at the same time, the weather patterns were just hugely disruptive. Now, there was a proposal a while ago for airlines to let people talk on their cell phones um, on the airplanes, but that was voted down, I think, by the FCC because a lot of people don't like it. You no, that, that was voted down by me. I okay, said I will, never, I will never allow that in Delta. Because, whether, whether they allow it or not, we're not allowing it okay. in Delta. Okay. All right. And that's because people don't want to hear other people's personal conversations, I, I, or they do know, want to hear them? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting on the Wi-Fi system, if you're a real geeky person, they can figure out how to crack the code, and oh. every now and then we catch a customer having, having a conversation, figuring out how to get in there, and we, we, we shut them down when we do. But it, it's, it's, it's a distraction. You know, t travel right. is, 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 is something that people actually want to escape a little bit. And, and go some other place, yeah. and, and there's, there's a privacy to that that I think is really important to me. Now, we don't talk that much about safety anymore in the sense that we don't see a lot of airplanes crashing, fortunately, but what is the safety record of, let's say, the American airline industry? Uh, it's the safest form of transportation in the world, of any form of transportation. Safer and than driving your car. Safer than driving a car, safer than crossing a street, safer than taking an e-scooter uh, down, the, down the street. Uh, you know, we, we don't talk about it because we don't compete on it. We don't think it's appropriate to compete on it. It's something that right. we all, the industry, it's a competitive industry, but that's something that we all join hands together with our brethren at the FAA yeah. to ensure that we learn from each other. And the attention that we pay to safety is, is, is you know, at the very yeah. highest levels of this company. Now, um, we haven't built a new airport in this country of any size since, uh, I think, 20, 22 or 23 years at, in Denver. Um, now, uh, LaGuardia is being redone and so forth. Um, but why is the, the air, why is the airline industry you're responsible for helping to build the airports or not? Well, we, we are actually building you're the building. new airports okay. ourselves. We got we got tired of waiting for the uh, for the government uh, partnerships that are that are out there that are trying trying to trying to crack that code. So we we've we've massively improved improved the flight experience, the onboard experience. The next thing is is the airports themselves. The airports in our country were built for the 1960s, right? Both in volumes and security and, and flow. You just think about the airports of this day. The airports today have you know, the big the big lobby areas that we call it the head right. houses, the big entrance areas. When was the last time you saw team, people congregating in a lobby of an airport? Never. You know, they're all at the gate trying to get on, on board uh, the, the airplane as quickly as they can. The f even the footprint of our airports are backwards. We need to move the, the gate space, the gate hold areas to be a much larger space for amenity and boarding. Cool. And the lobby, really, m most customers, the first thing they, they hit an airport is they want to they go through the security queue. The security apparatus, TSA, right. see, is, was not built with a 9-11 mindset. Uh, we can bust through all that, through biometrics and so technology. Building, and, but you're building airports where? We're building airports everywhere. We're building the new LaGuardia Airport, Delta on its own okay. balance sheet, you know, building that. It's going to take a few years. Uh, airport construction is the most difficult construction that's done because you've got to build it and live and operate it all right. at the same time. Building a new airport in LAX. Uh, we're building a new airport in Salt Lake City. We're building a new airport in Seattle, a new international facility. We've modernized Atlanta. We're going to be modernizing Minneapolis and Detroit. Actually, it was built even more recently than Denver. It was about 15 years ago, and I think that's probably the best airport in North America is the Detroit airport. Um, what, what is the, what's the best airport in the world? In, in the world? Oh, that's, that's a matter, that's a matter of, of, of uh, opinion. I, I think the Detroit airport in North America is the best. There's some great international okay. airports, but of course those airports are built by their governments with tens of billions of dollars that we don't have right. to, to invest in. Well, speaking of government support, you've been an advocate for not uh, allowing airlines that have government subsidies to compete against you, and is that a big problem? 
It is a big problem, and I have to give the, uh, the Trump administration great credit for recognizing that and reaching agreements with the UAE and Qatar last year right. to try to draw attention to it and stop, and stop it in terms so of at least, freeze, at least freezing where, where it's at. So are they um, doing anything about it, or what's going to happen? Yeah, I, th I think they absolutely are, are being responsive to the, to the administration. Today, in the, uh, in the Persian Gulf, there's 30 airplanes a day that fly between the Persian Gulf and the United States, not one of those by a U.S. airline. They're all by the, by the Middle Eastern Airlines. There's, if, there, if there was a fair playing field, which is what the open sky agreements require, there's no question that the, the U.S. Airlines right. would be operating that mindset. We can't because those fares are right. subsidized and the costs are, 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 what about are, the are air, paid for by the government. The air traffic control system. Some people would say it was kind of invented in the 1950s or 60s and we haven't really modernized it that much. Is it really that's, out that's, of date? That's true. Yeah, absolutely. It's, so it's what, can, what are you doing about that or what can you do? Well, we're working with the government. We, uh, we, we, we fully support the modernization of the air traffic control systems. It's a, it's a, but is it it's, safe it's now a, with the current air traffic? It is, it is absolutely safe, but unfortunately it's radar based. You know, many, many cars have better GPS in your car than we do in terms of what we're able to access in our planes. And, and the opportunities to, to improve the air traffic control system are not only speed for customers, but it's the efficiency, the sustainability of the environment, the opportunities to make a difference. Government dysfunction has been one of the reasons why the air traffic control system is, you know, because you've got, we've got the FAA on a, on a five-year leash. You can't, you can't change out the air right. traffic control systems with our current funding model. And that's why we've been advocating for some different models to actually go after a long-term technology pro, uh, project and do it well. Most countries around the world have better air traffic control systems than the U.S. does. So 9-11 was obviously a tragic event, and it came about because of people got on airplanes uh, without, before there was a TSA kind right. of requirement. Are you convinced that today something like that probably would be difficult to pull off? Absolutely. You know, the, the, the safety and the security of, of the airplane, not just the front door of where the passengers come through, but the back door, the, 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 the security property. We've, we've, uh, we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in, in controlling the perimeters of our airports as well. And, you know, the team is, is, is a thankless task. Uh, you know, every time we go through TSA, I think, you know, people get frustrated with, with the process and certainly some improvements can go on. But, you know, the people, the men and women that serve, serve in those, those, those jobs are really important to us. And uh, they, they keep us all safe and I'm proud of them. So today, uh, what do you do for outside activities? You're, this is a full-time job, obviously, but do you have any time for anything else? And how do you travel to some other place? Do you use Delta, or do you say, I want to go on somebody else's airline, somebody recognizes me? I, I, I always uh, travel on Delta when I, when I have, the, uh, have the choice. I, uh, I love, to, uh, love to golf. I don't get uh, much time, and I'm not very good at it, but, I, but I, do, I do enjoy that. I find golf, for me, is something that forces me to kind of think about something that's hard to do and focuses my, my mind in a, in, a, in a beautiful setting with, with friends, and I enjoy that. That's, that's my form of relaxation. But, you know, today's world, unlike, you know, or like many of you in the room, you know, with technology, you're never, you know, it's a full-time right. job. It's 24-7, and, you know, you, 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 the, the adrenaline you get from that right. is, is great, and it keeps you going. So uh, most business CEOs I know um, dress not unlike you. It's just like a mm -hmm. coat and tie, but they don't usually have shoes the type you have on. Um, <laughs> what are those shoes? These are, uh, these are blue uh, Lan Vin. Uh, somebody told me to pronounce the name right. It's a Paris based shoe. It's a, it's a dress sneaker. Uh, I, uh, I've taken to wearing uh, sneakers at work with my, my suit and tie. It's, it's kind of me. Uh, a, a good friend of mine uh, gave me a pair about a year and a half ago. And sure, I he looked, was a friend, or yes, he and, was a friend. And I, I, <laughs> I, I, looked, I looked at him and, and, and I said to her, I said, you didn't really think I'm going to wear these, are you? And she said, yeah. So I, okay. so I, I started wearing them. And, okay. uh, and it's, it's been good. And, and the reason I've, I've thought a lot about this question, David, is that you know, what we do is we, we do serious work. We do hard right. work. And I think it's important for myself to remind myself why well, I might do serious things, not to take myself too seriously. And it's kind of a, a, a reminder to stay light on my feet. To, to remember the importance of human human interaction. I so get those. I did. I did. I did also. I did also run the New York Marathon last year, so that, that actually helped my feet in, as well. What, getting two hours that. and no, that that was the first few miles. That was no. <laughs> but you, you finished. I finished. I, I'm, I'm here. To but talk did it have a Delta thing? Delta CEO logo on you? Yeah, I, I wore I wore my Delta colors loud and really? proud. Raised uh, two million dollars for cancer wow. research for children. Okay. And um, and I thank you. I can't, uh, 
I don't, I don't think I'm going to be doing another one of those. I'm still feeling the effects, but it was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. I haven't done a marathon. I would fly a marathon. I would fly maybe 26 <laughs> miles. But so um, you have a, a pattern of meeting with employees fairly regularly. You call it a velvet program. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. So when we went through our hard times back in the, the bankruptcy era, we didn't, have, we didn't have a lot of cash. We didn't have anything. You know, people were actually taking pay cuts. And we decided the only way we were ever going to be successful again, Delta has a proud history, was that we we're going to have to reconnect with our people and get something to catch their attention. So our people were downtrodden, years of pay cuts and job losses and, and, and all the, the difficult things we remember from almost 20 years ago. And so in downtown Atlanta, there was an abandoned Macy's building. In, in downtown Atlanta, and we, we decided to take out uh, a couple floors in this, in this abandoned building. I'm not sure we ever even paid for it. I think we just squatted in there. I don't know if they even knew we were in there. Uh, and we would bring our employees, and we brought all of our employees, you know, six, 700 at a time for a day, a day and a half of opportunity right. to talk about the airline. Uh, we had no PowerPoints, we had no slides, we, had, we, we deliberately kept it from being as uncorporate as possible. We had couches, we had chairs, we had curtains, we had low lights as people were walking in. People would come into the room, they'd see some of our people dancing around right. and trying to, to lighten up them. No wonder we were bankrupt, they probably thought. You know, this, this, we're, we got a crisis Thanks. on our hands, these people are dancing and it's abandoned Macy's building. But what it did is it got their attention to focus on what was really important. And our people wanted to know it wasn't their fault that we went through the hard times. I think so often when companies go through difficult times, employees are made to feel like they're the reason, that they're, they're too expensive, they're not productive enough, that they're a cost when they really are the very best asset you have. And we're not, the problem I told people, we didn't go bankrupt because our costs were too high, our revenues were too low. That we weren't able to actually generate the type of revenue production for our company. And so it was a chance to get the people to feel important, to get a voice in the hey. process, to say we're sorry and let's, let's try this one more time. And we do these meetings to this day. Now, we, now we, we can afford to actually pay for our own space and we do nice hotel lobbies and other, other venues, but we have, we have a dozen of them a year all around the US okay. where we bring people from different disciplines together and we talk about the okay. future. And I still lead every one of those as I did 15 years ago because that engagement is, is so critical in what we do. So how do you grow the value of your airline? You just make it uh, more profitable by flying more miles, or, or you, can you make more acquisitions or anything left to buy in this business? Well, we, we, are, we are a high growth business. You know, the airlines are typically thought to be a mature industry. Uh, you know, with, after all, there's not new places in the U.S. left to fly to. You know, building bigger airports, bigger airplanes, but not new destinations. So global expansion is, is certainly something that's very important to us at Delta, and we're, we're doing that through our partnerships in Delta flying, you know, many parts of the world. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I tell people about, about the airline industry that they may, they may find surprising is that we are, we are growing at 2 to 3x the economy. You know, airlines used to, the, the general rule of thumb in the airline business would not to grow outside the economy because that's when pricing would start to fall off a cliff. You'd have supply exceed demand. But the demand for our product is like never before. And, it, and it's fascinating. And you, you try to you ask yourself, why is it growing? Why is our, our top line revenue growing 8% a year, which has been growing the last several years? First of all, I think people are more aware of the world than ever before. People want to travel, they want to experience. Uh, as, and again, it's interesting because we are living in probably as divisive a time as, our, as, our, as, as we can recall for many years, you would think, which would hurt airline travel, but technology and social media and, and, and Instagram and pictures, you know, people want to go and explore and see for themselves something that they may have read about right. back, and now they feel it's affordable. Right. Opportunities not only for the millennials and the young generation that want to experience, but also baby boomers and, and all people. Uh, I, I, I saw my daughter, she had a picture of last month, she went to this, this uh, city in Turkey that's known for balloons, hot air balloons. I didn't even know this, this city existed, but apparently it's on all the millennials' bucket lists. To get to, get to it's a picture of her and her fiance up in this balloon, it's, it's amazing. People are learning about the world through, through wow. technology like never before. And airfare, as I mentioned, is one of the most affordable means of transportation known. You know, you think about what does it cost to rent a car versus what you can do with, with an airline ticket and, and our, our, our wow. travel is, is exponential in terms of the I impact. I would focus more on the baby boomers bucket list because they're gonna have to do those sooner than the millennials bucket list, right? Well, we're investing in both. Okay. We're investing in both, but, but travel is, is a high growth industry and you know, we're almost a $50 billion company, just under that in revenues. 
uh, in terms of in terms of size, growing at you know seven to ten percent a year, which is our targeted growth rate. It's been for the last couple of years, bringing adjacent businesses along. You talked about uh, the American Express relationship. We've got a great MRO, uh, maintenance okay. and repair over business, which is a billion dollar business and growing. We've got got a great cargo business. We've got adjacencies, and we've got a private jet business. We've got a, okay. a vacations business. So we're continuing to grow the ecosystem, the the, the technology, the innovators of today love to get inside Delta when they see the scale of 200 million people that we can bring to their innovation to the future. And we're, we're working on those and partnerships. Who started Delta Airlines? Mr. C.E. Woman in 1929. And it started in Atlanta? Or? It started in Monroe, Louisiana. Okay. Now, uh, suppose the uh, President of the United States said, like, I've, I've watched this interview and you are an impressive person. You've done a great job. Why don't you come into government and help us in some way? What would you say? Uh, I would say I, I, I'm happy to advise, but I'm not sure. I'm, I, I, got, I, got my, I got my work cut out for me here. We've so been, you're going to be doing this for a while? You're I'm going to be doing this for many years to come, hopefully, as, long, what, as long as our board will let me. All right. If somebody is watching this and, and says, I would like to run an airline someday, uh, you would say that's not a great ambition, or you would say it's a great ambition, but whatever you would say, is, what would be the characteristics that somebody needs to run an, an airline? I think it's, it's a high energy uh, business. It's very dynamic. You know, every single day we show up, we have 6,000 flights a day, and something happens. You know, the playbook changes, weather something changes. Something goes wrong. Does they call something, you at home? Or? No, normally, I, many times I do. Uh, but technology, you know, oftentimes you stay connected through text and whatnot. There's always something happening. You're, you're dealing with 200 right. million people a year, 600,000 passengers a day all around the world. We don't operate 24 seven. We operate 48 seven because when you think about the back of the clock flying that we do all over the world it's it's a uh, it's it's you know, our days are actually twice the, the length of a normal day we have uh, big assets expensive assets so it's it's something for long-term capital allocation you got to think smart right. about the priority and you've got to make decisions uh, because those decisions can will last for a long, uh, long time if you don't get them right. And so, using technology and digital, we're, we're investing right. heavily in digital and expanding the uh, well, expand our universe. Suppose I'm a college graduate or a young business school graduate. Why should I want to work at an airline or Delta? Well, what's the advantage of it for me? Free travel. <laughs> Anybody like free travel? For not only themselves but their partner, right? And uh, and, and and reduce travel for their the family. Partner gets uh, so, free travel too. Excuse me? You said a partner gets free and a travel. Every employee has a partner that they can designate for free travel as well. You know, I will give you an application, David, if you want <laughs> to. What about people that just interview you? Can they get that too? <laughs> no. we, can, we can talk. Uh, the travel, when I say free travel, it's space available travel. So, you know, obviously once the plane is full with our frequent flyers oh. and travelers, everyone, and there, if there's space available, our, right. our employees get so, a chance so to So that's why people travel. should work for you in addition? That, that's, a, that's a great reason. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a high highly technical uh, field, uh, whether it's pilots or mechanics or our technologists, our airport agents, you know, people, people in, in, in a, a high line of skill, and so that, that experience gets rewarded through compensation and pay that profit sharing that I talked about. And the third thing is, is if you love people, it's a great business because you are, you are out in the public eye every single day. We do not have desk jobs. You know, our, 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 our desk job is in the sky. And, you're in, and every day, your, your work environment is different. And you've got different people coming through. And, and you have to adapt to all reasons. You think about why people travel. People travel for all reasons on an airplane, for happy reasons, for sad reasons, for, for business, for, for pleasure, to go explore, to go meet their grandchild for the first time. And there's all this emotion that's in this tube of roughly 200 you know, people all sitting within 40 yards of one another that, that have to, so it's a, it's a social experience as well. And people that want to actually make the world better get into travel. Okay. So you're happy with your job and you like doing it and right. you intend to do it for quite a while? I love my job. I and my if job. I had to spare money to invest in the stock market, I should buy your stock because? Because we're, we're growing, uh, we're, we're profitable, we've got an investment grade rating back in our, in our, uh, on our balance sheet. And you know, the, 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 you know, the thing about the industry, as I mentioned earlier, the volatility of the past right. century, not just the past decade, we really do believe it's a thing of the past. And when you, when you generate the, the, the level of profitability and the growth rate and the returns coupled okay. with a high quality workforce and a high quality operation, okay. 
That's, that's the recipe for success. Not all airlines make it. You know, airlines are still, you see in Europe, and occasionally airlines right. are still going bust. We've got, we've got a formula that's working. Now, Warren Buffett, does he ever fly Delta, or does he give you, call, give you advice? Does he call with advice? I, uh, I, do, I, do, uh, I do hear from Warren from time to time, and uh, his advice is keep doing what you're doing. Okay. And let's suppose you're going to leave here today and fly somewhere on Delta, and you're running late for the plane. Can you call them? No, no, and say, never. You can't do that. There are, there are, there are, there are a few things that can get you. There are a few things that can get you fired in Delta. That's near the top of you the You can't chart. do that. If you if you wind up holding a plane for an executive for any reason, that's 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 an immediate no-no. We don't we don't we don't we don't hold the door. We don't hold anything. It's our responsibility to get there on time. And if we don't, guess what? We got another plane in an hour. What about for members of the Economic Club of uh, Washington? Would you hold it for them? They are all welcome to travel on Delta. Right. Thank you very much for an interesting conversation.